Okay, Frank, whenever you're ready. Everybody ready? Everyone on the air? Good, Nick. Good evening, everyone. If we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's good to see everybody. Tonight, we uh, 1.4, a motion to adopt tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll need a motion 1.5 to approve the board meeting minutes of October 28th, 2020. I'll make that motion. Second. Is there any discussion or any issues with the draft? Nope. No issues, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So tonight we're gonna to start with our presentations. I believe, Mr. Harry, you are up first. I just want to know why you didn't wear your Halloween costume to tonight's meeting. So it was the best part of my week, watching the elementary school parade that you posted <laughs> online. Before you begin, I just want to let you know that was fabulous. And I think a lot of the parents were loving it and all the comments online. You guys really did a great job. It was as if it was, you know, normal, as normal could be. So thank you. Great thank job. You. My, uh Daughters had some comments for me in my choice of costume. <laughs> uh, so good evening, Mr. Petrolak, Mr. Zambet's Board of Education members, and the Chester community watching this evening, whether in person or remote. Uh, first and foremost, of course, I'm happy to announce Chester Elementary School will be reopening this Thursday, November 12th, which is an orange day for students. As mentioned in the blasted out to all CS families today, Individuals identified by the Orange County Department of Health as contacts have been notified this afternoon and will not be in attendance. I will say, as always, our decision to close is reflective of the safety protocols we have in place on a daily basis, which exceed recommendations from the Department of Health in order to ensure the continued safety of all students and staff present in school. And so I'll give you an example. Um, we have our procedures in place for sanitizing since, since opening. And uh, recently, uh, as of over the weekend, um, thanks to Jim Fries and Rick, Rick, excuse me, Vic Rossi, um, we were able to bring in, they were able to bring in a, an additional sanitation using electrostatic sprayers. So not only did our custodial staff do their normal cleaning procedures of all the desks and all the rooms, there was then another layer of cleaning that took place uh, last evening and this evening, um, spraying the entire room of every um, area in the building. So again, we're going above and beyond, and we continue to do so in our decisions uh, to benefit the health and safety of our students and staff. We currently have 76% of students in person and since the report, since our closing, just three have requested a change to remote. So there's only a change in three uh, since the information I presented in my board report. Okay, so transitioning to, transitioning to some highlight, highlights. In regard to assessment, NWEA maps testing will be completed this week. Obviously, we had to extend that by two days due to the closure. Uh, students in K through two were assessed in reading and math. Students in three through five were assessed in reading, language usage, and math. Teasers are also finalizing individualized reading assessments incorporating fluency and comprehension, and that helps us to identify whether a student is on level, below level, or exceeding and needs to be challenged. Uh, teachers are also beginning to conduct individual assessments via Google Meets for our remote learners, whether it be a sight words assessment, math, or an alternate subject area. So with that said, it's important to let families know this week, the two-day remote schedule followed a blue and orange day in regard to the Google Meets offered. However, 
Should we transition to a full remote learning model at any point in time, we will have a K-5 schedule implemented, which provides daily in-person instructional blocks for students. So you would have several Google Meet, excuse me, several, I did need that water, several Google Meets in person uh, for your student. Um, should you have siblings at the elementary school or in the district, it really is important to make sure that your child has access to their own device at home. So if that is currently not the case, please make sure to let us know, let your child's teacher know, so that we can ensure that there is a Chromebook available to go home and be at school if need be. Uh, report cards will be mailed home on Thursday, November 12th. And parent conferences will begin on the 19th, which is a half day, and continue through Wednesday the 25th, also a half day. Uh, Tuesday, next week, Tuesday, November 17th, is picture retake day at the elementary school. So please return the package to your child's classroom teacher if you would like a retake, and we will schedule that for you. Obviously, if your student was absent uh, and you're interested in, in getting that picture done, um, please reach out. If you are a remote learner and would like a retake, we will make that happen for you. Please reach out and contact the main office, or if you didn't get to take a picture in the first round, please contact the main office and we'll make sure that happens. Okay, to finish up, some CES Proud highlights. Again, special thank you to Emily Downick, Diane Murphy, and the CES PTA for their efforts on a successful socially distanced Halloween parade video shared out with parents. Thank you to the remote families who were able to share out pictures for our CES team in costume. I am extremely proud to share. Chester Elementary School was recognized as the recipient of Orange and Rockland's 2020-2021 STEM grant thanks to the efforts of our art teacher, Emily Downick, in collaboration with our music teacher, Mr. Sparkman. Uh, they proposed a grant that would provide our students an opportunity to create interactive artwork with sound, and that's using a bare conductive touchboard and without getting into the engineering or uh, electrical specifics to that, it's a, micro, it's a microcontroller board, and it has a, a great deal of potential for our students, and it's almost $1,000 worth of equipment that they received uh, due to this grant. And I am going to quote the Orange and Rockland president and CEO, Robert Sanchez, in saying, quote, in the face of dif difficult classroom challenges, this year's STEM grant recipients have shown admirable resilience and unwavering commitment to their students' education. They truly are our classroom heroes. Their proposals are impressive in scope and application and will inspire learning for a brighter future. And I couldn't agree more for their efforts. Uh, our staff participated in a training on best practices in supporting our ENL learners, and that was led by Regina DeFazio and supported in collaboration with Alana Sullivan, both of which are outstanding ENL educators at CES. Many thanks to Rachel Loftus, who is responsible for the district presentation of our social and emotional learning program, Choose Love, and that was led by the originator of the program and really uh, an amazing, dynamic individual, Scarlett Lewis. So I'll close with one of the comments she shared with the staff, which I believe to be appropriate for all of this in our ever-changing circumstances, and that was the point of being present, uh, to be in the moment, and to take in the small micro moments of joy. So in honor of Veterans Day tomorrow, and all of the moments leading up to that day and today, I'll take this moment to thank the staff, students, and families for all of their continued support. It is, a, it is truly a joy to be working with each and every one of you. Any questions this evening? Are there any questions or comments? I just had one. Absolutely. Um, Regarding the assessments for students, um, yes. is that for in-person learners only, or is that, how are we assessing our remote learners? Great question. So the NWA MAPS assessment was for in-person, and we also extended the opportunity to take the assessment for our remote learners, and we did have several um, come in, uh, and also, you know, obviously going through the um, safety protocols to come into the building. Only the students were allowed in to take the assessment and the parent would come in to pick them up. So we did have several that were, that did take part in that. In terms of the Faunus and Pinnell and other 
um, individualized assessments. Our first grade teachers, for example, have implemented the reading online and the student, they put the reading piece um, on screen and the student is able to, and again, these are individual Google, Google Meets, um, so they're conducting the reading remotely, the reading assessment, assessment remotely. And that's been a conversation that has extended to um, all types of assessments for learners because to be honest, um, in terms of equity and the, um, a real interpretation of a student's individual ability to complete their work with or without parent support, it's important to have an opportunity to assess the child individually. So we've had teachers um, doing Google Meets individual for sight words where the list of words will be put up on the screen and the child will read off the words so that, um, again, it's not just using those online assessments, um, it's, in, it's a real-time in-person assessment. And we're looking to extend those opportunities going forward for remote That's learners. Any other questions? No, but I would hope that you would, for Emily and Brandon, thank them for their hard work, the fact mm -hmm. that they participated. And after what he did during the summer on everything he did online, I don't think there's anything that he cannot accomplish. <laughs> Some of the music things he did while you know everyone was on remote the end of the year and through the summer, uh, really creative, your team there. And I would say to you and Mr. Flanagan to uh, take your own advice also and to uh, take in every moment because we know what you, the pressure that you're all under and to take each day, breathe, and you all are continuously making things happen, but make sure you're doing the same. Thank you. Just so that uh, you and guys are in that same mode that you're always in, because you are hard chargers and we recognize that. So please make sure you follow that. I intend to this evening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. Now, unless there's anyone else in the room, I guess we'll have to hear from Mr. Flanagan. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present this evening. Thank you, Mr. Sambit, Mr. Petrolek, members of the Board of Education. Um, I'm always excited to be up here. I'm always excited to follow Ms. O'Hara, who always does an, an incredible job. Um, just to go over a couple things on my board report before I move in and just, uh, and just review a couple of items. You can see that our remote numbers at Chester Academy were up a little bit again this month. Um, we went from last month where we were at 187 students up to 215. Most of that is reflective among the 12th graders um, where we're seeing a lot of our seniors that, are that have moved towards remote instruction in that direction. Um, we continue as we see an uptick in cases in the county. We do have people that, that have expressed interest in moving in that direction. But it is exciting. We've also had a few people that have come back the other way, and we're always excited to welcome them back because of that social-emotional component. It's good for students to see their friends, and, and we're excited to welcome everybody back when they, when they get here. Our engagement levels at Chester Academy, and, and this is something I just wanted to go over and explain. We have a, we, we, we're engaging the overwhelming majority of our students, and those students that aren't choosing to engage, we are in contact with, which is a good thing. Um, the, so with, with our engagement levels that high, the one, the one message that, I, that I've been trying to get out to, to our students, to our parents, and, and to the Board of Education is that our, we have a lot of students doing really well, and we have some students that are struggling. And so we encourage those students that are struggling that we are here, we do want to help, we offer help, um, we're reaching out for help, and we encourage people to take that help. Because remote instruction is different than any type of uh, instructional model that anyone's ever had before. And so we, we're here after school. We have office hours available for students during the day, after students go home, on Mondays, and we're trying to find times where we can individually meet with students if they're having any issues. So please, we encourage people to always come forward and, and to ask for help. Um, a couple of other items. Um, we are going to have our report cards on Friday. So, and that's going to be a true assessment. You know, we, we wanted people to to really understand where they're at and where we might need to make adjustments or improvements as, as we move ahead to the second quarter. Um, we do want to congratulate, we've had a lot of students that have worked really hard with this pan, through this pandemic and this crisis and have done really well and we're really proud of our students for that. 
Um, we continue to provide, and I'll, and I'll even have uh, other updates this week, more information on Google Classroom for parents. And a lot of it is just a, we're, we're continuing to put out a lot of the same information, but for parents that are having trouble navigating the Google Classroom, we always encourage you, get into your child's Google Classroom, see what's going on from the perspective of the student. We do have the parent reports as well, um, but we are trying to always provide instructions, and if you need help, just give us a call, and we can help you navigate the Google Classroom. We could show you all the little tricks, what tabs to click on. You can tell where all the assignments are and, uh, and what's coming up. I've actually... Uh, participated in a few professional developments over the last month uh, having to do with diversity and implementing more, more diverse practices into our building and having difficult conversations that I think a lot of staff want to have and might be uncomfortable addressing. And so uh, three different professional developments that, that I've had the opportunity to, to attend really addressed having those difficult conversations and addressed some of the, the current issues that are going on in society and areas where as, as, as a building, we could always make improvements. And I've had the opportunity to talk to our teachers at faculty meetings and tell them these are things we can discuss at pre-observation conferences, post-observation conferences, when we're talking about students in just ways that we can make sure we're addressing all of our students' needs and concerns. Um, and so that is, uh, and, and offer for our teachers, if they do find professional developments that they think can help them to uh, become a more well-rounded teacher in terms of addressing areas they might not have totally found a comfort zone in life that we want to support them and, and provide them with that professional development. Um, we have made a couple of adjustments with some of our remote numbers going up and our in our in-person numbers uh, by a few students in, in each grade. It's not that many students but it did help us to do some co a cohort consolidations. Um, so we have we're able to combine some cohorts, which is good because if we had a small cohort and another small cohort, we're able to provide those students with a few other faces to, to be able to, to work with in their classrooms. Um, we, if we, like Ms. O'Hara stated, in the event that we were to, if we were to implement a synchronous model, um, if we were in the need to go to a remote instruction, we would be implementing a five-day synchronous, uh, or I should say a, a fully synchronous model Tuesday through Friday with Monday being an asynchronous day. We would follow the nine period day schedule that's in, pa in uh, parent portal and we would follow Tuesday being a day one, Wednesday being a day two, the way we normally do our schedule and to assure that if we were on remote everybody is getting everything that they need. Um, we had virtual spirit week, the, the week of Halloween, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we did it Mon uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and then repeated the same Thursday and Friday. So for the first time in a, in a while, Chester Academy, and I'm not, I'm not promising that it'll always be here, but we did some Halloween costumes. And uh, not only uh, students that were very creative, but staff members as well, which was interesting, um, and, and a lot of fun. So we kind of let our hair down a little bit. I let my hair down a little bit for that say, one. I was going to say, how's that going? So, um, and um, just a couple of things in closing. I wanted to thank the, the town of Chester uh, police, fire, and emergency responders. We did have an alarm that went off uh, last week um, due to a... Uh, we had a belt in one of our, our water fountains that I guess was running just a little too hard and, and, and presented an odor, and uh, that needed to be changed out. But we don't take chances with student safety, so we called our friends at, at the local first responders, and they did a great job getting here quick and, and, and helping out. Um, we, um, we also, over the course of the last week, conducted two lockdown drills, one for our A-Day students and one for our B-Day students. They were instructional lockdown drills. Um, so students weren't pushing into a corner. They were socially distant, and teachers would explain to them what would happen in the event of a lockdown. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to say thank you and, and happy Veterans Day for two people that have served us, Mr. Pashnik and Mr. Sambitz, as part of our thank Chester you. community. We thank you, and, and happy Veterans Day, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions? No, but I was just going to, I don't know if anyone else knows, we do appreciate that you did wear your Halloween costume to tonight's meeting. <laughs> You really it was pulled the it most off frightening tonight. one in the school. You pulled it off tonight. <laughs> they asked me to never wear it again. But uh, I did just have one question, sure. and Kathy, if you, it's the same to both of you. I think we talk about it every meeting. And it's exactly what you addressed about families, you know, reaching out to us. Are you getting any of that unsolicited, where you're getting people calling for help, whether it's, you know, whether it's technology based or just help? We do get people that call for help, and I, and I think that some people, 
may be hesitant to call because they, you know, they, I, I've talked to community members that say, I know, I know you guys have a lot going on over there, but it's, it, call us. You're what we have going on. You know, we want to help you, and if you're having an issue, reach out and, 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 you know, we will find the right person to help address your issue, whether it's myself or someone in technology or a counselor or a teacher that you just haven't been able to, you've been emailing back and forth with and you just need to get on the phone. And that's what, you know, because we say it online, I think a lot of parents, well, uh, they'll go online first, and they, instead of calling the school, and I'm quietly trying to prod people, you know, to call, but I just was wondering also, Kathy, if you're having, um, just a moment, John. Six feet, Kathy. <laughs> but just as far as people just no, I figured I'd be on the mic for it. I did want to mention that I had uh, a total of four parents reach out in regard to a significant um, announcement that the school was closing, and so... Um, while it's uh, challenging to receive that information without any specifics, understandably the question is, is does it affect my child? Uh, is, it, is it this grade level? And um, per Department of Health, uh, when it's under investigation and HIPAA privacy laws, we're unable to share that, but at least um, I did respond to the parent and I, that reached out and I did let them know. And, um, one other question that I had gotten was in reference to full remote learning and what that schedule would look like, and that will be shared out with families just so that they're aware whenever it is a full remote model, this is what we will morph into. Um, and oftentimes uh, parents, if they call or if they email, they start with an apology, and my reply is always a thank you because whenever I get that question, be it in a phone call or in an email, it alerts me, you know, it, it helps me answer a question. I always say that I, I can't, I don't go on social media. I understand that it, it's a place to, to vent, and, and um, understandably so. But uh, anything that gets resolved gets resolved with a phone call to me or an email, and in, um, it's, it's really helpful, actually, to get the feedback. So I, so I welcome that, and I appreciate those that did reach out that had concerns, and hopefully uh, folks are a little bit more at ease with regard to the fact that if it was a situation, um, you know, you were notified. And again, we have uh, opted to exceed uh, Department of Health safety in, in terms of the decision to close. Good. Back to you, John. No, and that, I think, is what's, you know, what's going on in the county is things are increasing. It's, you know, kind of spinning in different ways that, you know, we, we were hoping we wouldn't expect, you know. But the way things are going, we all have to be prepared. And I think it's important that we say it at every meeting, and I know that we do, and I think I put you two on the spot every time, is that people should call the school. We can answer any question that they need. Um, online is fine, but it'll take it's a two or three extra steps in other people's opinion. Just call the school. We'll get the right answer. Someone here is, like John said, we will solve the problem, yeah. whatever it is. So please call us at the school district, absolutely. and we'll yes. make sure that everything is taken care of. I you was know. absolutely one of those parents that was a vocal parent in my child's education, so I, I understand that, and it's with good intentions always, so, and it's helpful. Oh, absolutely. Thank and you. The way that you are receptive and the billings are receptive, that's, you know, that, I only ask it because I keep seeing people just going to the Internet rather than to us, and I know I sound like a broken record, but the answers are here, and we'll, we'll get the answers to people, so... So thank you both for that. Nice job, John Flanagan. As always. I think your hair looks great tonight. <laughs> and that'll bring us uh, tonight to tonight's first public comment section. Anyone who would like to address the board, please step up to the podium. And just your name and uh, where you live. Uh, my name is Tim Ferraro. I hey, um, live in Goshen. I'm Chester resident. Yep. Uh, been a resident of Chester School District for the past 14 years. My wife and I have three children, two in the elementary school, a first grader and a third grader, and one here in the academy with, as an eighth grader. Um, first, I want to say I recognize that these are certainly challenging times. So I thank you for all the stuff that you've done for trying to go and get the schools open and get them uh, moving in the right direction. Both principals at uh, elementary school and the academy have been doing a fabulous job with what they're doing with their staff. So I just want to go and put that out there on the, uh, so everybody in the community knows that, all right? Um, 
I'm a teacher myself, and I've been a teacher for 18 years, okay? Uh, I recognize the important role that schools play at the, in the community. Uh, having the elementary school open for five days a week has been helpful for the students and the parents on so many levels that you don't even, you don't even understand. The district that I'm in, we rotate back, we have cohorts that we go back and forth, uh, A days, B days, A, B, C days, cohorts that we're doing. So for getting the elementary school kids in five days a week, I think that's very helpful on so many levels. Reason I'm here is I'd like to just address an issue that was brought to my attention um, with recent communication with Mr. Flanagan. Uh, over the weekend, I asked if he could ask the staff if he could be a little bit more, uh, to just remind the staff to be a little bit more lenient, especially on the days that elementary school is closed. Um, being that many of the parents are working um, and they're relying on the older siblings to go and kind of help out with the remote instruction. Um, I know that's, that was certainly the case in my, in my household this, um, this week, okay? Uh, I can tell you right now, on Monday, which was the remote day when my oldest daughter was home, uh, I was teaching from the basement because my school has been closed for the last two weeks due to the COVID cases. So I have been teaching 20, 23, 24, 25 kids live streaming every period of the day, synchronous learning, like um, they're proposing, like we're proposing to do here in Chester once the schools close down. Not if, but it's more a matter of when because that's pretty much the way, that's the direction the numbers are going and I'm not trying to go and sugarcoat it right now. And I think we all, I think everybody has to, I know in this situation that you're in right now, it's you have to kind of dance around it. Nothing's been official yet, but it keeps creeping that way. And I know there is a big talk of a holiday break coming up soon for um, the schools in the region. That's the, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, I know on Monday when I had my eighth grade daughter home, I had no interruptions. We were able to go, there, she was able to go and assist the first grader and the third grader logging into Google Meets, because if any of you have first and third graders who are trying to go and do remote learning. Have you ever witnessed that? If you haven't, let me tell you, it's rather entertaining. Sad, but it's entertaining, okay? How do I go and log in? How do I get into a Google Meet, okay? Um, today, when my oldest daughter was back at school, I had to go and I was home, I was teaching, my, I was working, and again, this, is probably played across, this probably played out in multiple households across the district, um, to no fault of yours, but this is the situation of what's going on with the younger kids. Older kids, I think they can, fifth grade, sixth grade, for the most part, they might be up there a little bit more uh, attuned as to what they have to do. Um, kindergarten, first, second, third, even fourth grade students, they have a little bit more difficult time of going and trying to log in. So my day started with me dropping off my eighth grade daughter here in the morning, went home from 7.30 until 8.30, I was printing off papers, getting my first grade and third grade student ready to go and log into their Google Meets, um, having them go and do their work, went downstairs to teach my lesson from 9 to 9.45, 9.45 until 10.30, I was up teaching first and third grade again. Interesting, good change of pace from being a sixth and seventh grade teacher, okay? Um, but, and then I went back downstairs, taught my next class, then came up for my lunch break, made them lunch, had them post their assignments to the Google Classroom, and then had to go and um, get them back on for a 12 o'clock meet for one and get ready for, thankfully my wife came home in the afternoon and she was able to go and pick up the slack and she was able to help out a little bit because her school day was over. Um, and I recognize that um, this is unprecedented times, like I said, okay? But my issue and my concern really is not in the event that this district is gonna close, but when the schools close. Okay, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to repeat around the bush. And I, again, I know I'm in a different situation being on this side of the microphone than in the situation that many of you are in right now, being board members, school principals, and the superintendent. But when the districts close down for whatever amount of time that it's going to be, hopefully not as long as it was in March, from March until the end of the year. Hopefully it's not to that state. But the numbers are creeping up. We see there's meetings going on all around education, and being in education, I know that, and not asking you to go and go out there and say it on public record right now, but it's a matter of not if, but when. My issue is that when schools close, if it's not region-wide, how are the younger kids, so what are, parents, what are parents supposed to do when the academy goes to synchronous learning and parents are back at work? and you have younger kids? That's the, that's the big question. And I know that teachers, they're doing great jobs, the principals doing a great job trying to go and assist with that, but that's the big issue. 
I think my, con my big concern is the fact that Chester had the opportunity, in my opinion, to go and start with the synchronous learning for the older kids at the beginning of the year, and then if it went to asynchronous, because the school, then go to asynchronous if the school closes for a short amount of time, because then they can assist with childcare issues for younger siblings at home. I know we're doing that in my district right now, like I said, since September, live streaming to everybody. And it's not a matter of technology. You could do it with the teachers in the room. You have five kids in the classroom. You have a laptop set up, Google Meet going. You kind of teach the five or six kids you have in the classroom, and then you have the 20 kids that are on the computer screen interacting with the teacher and the other students. That, that could have been a, that could have been a um, plan that they could have implemented. And I'm not second guessing this. I'm really not. I'm not playing Monday morning quarterback because I'm a parent that is active in my, student, in my child's education. Okay? I'm the parent in the district that volunteers to go and help out when I can. I offered to be on the school reopening committee. I was told by Mr. Petrolak, spots were filled. So he put me in with the athletic and extracurricular activities. Signed up for that, worked with Mr. Aguilar on that. I was glad to go and bring in the NFHS COVID-19 uh, uh, coaching course to his awareness back in June, May or June when I met with him. And I also brought up the fact that the why before school and after school program could, should not be overlooked. And I think Ms. Nagler, you were on the meeting with me when I brought that up, okay? Um, and I'm getting, I'm getting upset right now just because I could see what's going to go and happen to the younger kids and the families. And it's not just my family, okay? I think my, my wife and I are both educators, so we can go and catch them up. It's the other students that are, the other families in the district that have young children that may fall through the cracks. And that's, my life has been, my adult life has been nothing but going and helping out for children. I teach, I coach, I'm involved in the community in so many levels, and this is what, this is the frustrating part. And I do reach out, and I have reached out to the school. And this is, if the only people that really know me in here are the two principals, and that's just for me being involved in the, in my kids' education, Mr. Petrolak and I have had limited interactions, but I've reached out. I haven't caught, this is out of character for me to come here and talk to the Board of Ed in a public forum and say, you know, this is, this is where I think you missed the boat. Because I didn't come here when my kid's soccer team didn't have a coach, and I volunteered to go and coach for free after having 19 years of coaching experience. Push the side. I didn't go and complain last year when I get my cell phone number handed out to coaching staff members here in Chester and they're calling me about trying to drum up community involvement for passing the athletic field resolution. Didn't come here, didn't come that time. Those are minor headaches. The education of our children, that is the stuff that, that is the bigger problem right here. So if you see me getting upset and you see me kind of and you hear it in my voice right now, it's because I'm very concerned about not who do I choose from? Who do I say and go, all right, my eighth grade daughter can go and have an education on this day, and my first and third grade daughters can't. My first and third grader can't because I have to choose which, who's getting what education on what day when, we go, when the school district closes and we're going to synchronous learning. When we should have done synchronous learning, in my opinion, and I would have, and again, if I was brought into the reopening committee like I volunteered to do, I would have brought some perspective as being a community member, a teacher, a parent, and a coach. And I was pushed to the side for that. So picture that next time you want, if you want to go and see a first and third grader go and do remote learning or have a choice which person's going to go and get a better education that day, the eighth grader or the first and third grader, I don't know, I don't know what I can go and say. I don't know what I should choose. What would you do? Tim, I don't, I don't really have any answers, except I can tell you that, because you're living it, but half of those frustrations, and probably more, have been living, I know, with me and this entire board and the administration, like you said, since this whole situation. And to a person, every single person in here has been working to make it work in the best way possible. 
and obviously with your situation, I think you're you're living the ultimate of all the problems that this brings. And yeah. I, and I appreciate that you're the first person as a parent with each age group, you know, to be standing in front of me. But not that I haven't heard, I'm sorry, not that we, I haven't heard it, because I'm hearing it at state level, county level, and everything that we're involved with, in order to make this work for the entire community. But the unfortunate thing is when I offered to go and do that, I was pushed aside. Yeah, and I, I apologize. I, don't, I, I, I would like to address that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Ferraro, you did reach out and you expressed interest in, in participating in the reopening committee. Uh, the way the reopening committee was uh, put together was we reached out to recognized organizations in the district. And for parent representatives, we reached out to the PTA president and the PTSA president in the elementary school and, and the academy, respectively. <clears throat> and it was uh, the responsibility and uh, the decision of, of those organizations about who their representatives would be on, on the reopening committee. I know, but I reached out to you personally. Yes, you did. Uh, and there were other people that also reached out and wanted to participate. And uh, as it was, the committee had approximately 20 people on it. And uh, that included, as I said, representatives of not only parent organizations, but employee organizations, uh, nurses and uh, counselors, administrators, teachers, etc. Uh, it was a very large committee. Uh, what we did to uh, involve more people uh, and the way that you got involved was we established subcommittees and invited people to participate. Uh, but there was no way that we could possibly involve everybody that wanted to participate in the reopening committee. We had to make some decisions. And the and decision I, was to, uh, to speak with and work with the people from recognized groups. And I recognize that, but like I said, from being the cross-section uh, that I'm representing there, I would have thought that I would have been a good fit to be on that. From being a parent, a teacher, somebody at the elementary level and at the academy level that's all I was saying and that's and, and again that's and, why and I said would, and that's why I said that I think you missed I missed you missed the boat I think and I think if we had that discussion back in J May June July August when we were trying to when the districts were trying to go and set up these plans I think it would have been helpful to have that insight in there uh, I, I would uh, once again state that there were many different perspectives represented on that committee and uh, we did evaluate a lot of different approaches, and we made a decision about an approach. Okay. Uh, and I, I just have to take issue with your characterization of you being pushed aside. Uh, I think that's very unfair to say that you were pushed aside because it was explained to you uh, why you were not invited to the large committee, and uh, you were not pushed aside. You were invited to participate in the subcommittee. Okay. We can just we could agree to disagree on that. So and that's all. But. Um, that's my that's my piece I just think that you know I think it's a tough situation and I recognize there's no right answer I get it but we need to as parents they need they need to know what's going on just so because child care is gonna be a big issue more than you can imagine before school care closing why closing you can't really ask grandparents to come in and do it right now because grandparents are really in the high-risk category so I mean that's gonna be it's gonna be tough to go and deal with these closures if and when it happens. Mm. Uh, I, I, I will address uh, the child care issue. That is a great concern of ours. Uh, the YMCA does run a before and after school program, as you know, and we have had uh, and are having ongoing discussions with the Y about providing a daytime program in the event and when uh, it may be necessary for us to go full remote. And that would just be for Chester schools? And that would be for Chester schools primarily. Um, we don't know what kind of demand there will be, uh, but we are working with the Y to see that they will have sufficient staffing. Uh, we are having discussions with our administrators in the buildings to find out if we'll have uh, to make sufficient space available that will allow uh, social distancing and all the other uh, protocols that we have to put in place. But that is a very uh, active discussion that's going on presently. Okay. Oh, thank you for your time. Oh, t Tim, and also I would just say uh, we appreciate and want your input, you and every other parent in the community. So please, this is the forum, and you know this is the place to have the conversation. So. Uh, and I get that. But and we all appreciate. And I. And as like I said before, this problem is you know we're tackling it as it comes like you said and 
anything, any input we get, we, we need it, we want it, and we'll listen. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you very and much. And thank you for teaching also. Thank you. Was anyone else in or just I think that's it. Uh, that'll bring us to four uh, roundtable uh, and policy discussions. Okay. Shall I begin? Sure. Um, I'd like to invite Mr. Brennan to uh, provide some information uh, related to uh, state funding and uh, different business operations. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, in the context of, of COVID, and uh, I think it's important for Mr. Brennan to provide some uh, updates and some information. Well, thank you. Um, we've got on our agenda tonight the approval of the tax collector's report, which is sort of a uh, financial mild, uh, mile marker that we like to get you up to date on, on what's been happening in the world of school finance. Uh, we'll start with the really good news. We, from the writing of the memo to the board about the collector's report, it's actually gone up from 94 to 95% collection, which in this year I thought was, was astounding that we were able to, to hit that, that much of the collections during a, a small two-month period. So that was fabulous. The problems come in the fact that New York State is broke. And right now we've received no guidance from the governor, from the Division of Budget, from New York State Education Department, NISBA, ASBO, Twitter, on what it is we're to expect to fund our operations this year. Uh, what we do know is that we've had some, some problems. The summer state aid payments were reduced by 20%. A lot of news came from this when a lawsuit came to the state regarding that. So they waived holding back the 20% on those state aid payments that Chester and 95% and of the school districts get $0 for. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate that they didn't withhold the monies we don't get normally <laughs> anyway. But that reduction of 20% aid on our summer payments amounted to $190,000 for Chester schools. That's just the 20%. Uh, last week on Friday, which isn't unusual for what we've been going through to get bad news dropped on us sometime after 4 o'clock on a Friday, uh, was that the state ruled that they will not be funding any transportation expenditures for services between March 18th and the end of the school year. So the governor's executive order said that we needed to pay that. The Federal CARES Act said that we could not stop paying contractors and others. But the state is not going to aid us on that. So that amounts to about $150,000. The Federal CARES Act, I mentioned that briefly, uh, that was given to the state back in April, was withheld for a very long time until we finally got the guidance releasing the funds. Unfortunately, a lawsuit has changed how that's done, so there's 12 more who could <coughs> jump through. Uh, that was $110,000 that the state stole from our state aid because they said, well, you got it in the federal aid. So there's, I'm expecting a lot more of that to come. So that's the gloom, and usually that's followed by the doom, but in this case I've got some good news and some things going forward. Uh, the health insurance premiums have leveled off in the area. We're in a self-insured consortium, Orange Ulster Health. Uh, there's been a huge decrease in elective surgeries and other elective issues. The COVID costs are still there and they're pretty great, but it's, it's really saved the day where we're not expecting big increases in that area at all. And we also have an opportunity, some of you actually, I've got a, the pleasure of saying most of you, remember 2012 when we, did, we got this book in our hands. This book was the refinancing of the debt that built this building. And it had initially a 10-year call. So the original debt was 2003. We were able to refinance in 2013. Uh -huh. At 2013, we were able to get a eight-year no-call limit. So I've asked our bond council to prepare a bond resolution to refinance the remaining debt. We expect that that's going to save us about $150,000 a year for the next 10 years. A year. 
per year for the next 10 years. Uh, the very conservative estimates is 1.5 million to 1.8 million nice. in savings. Um, and one of the, the things that I pointed out to bond council and to our advisors is stability. And we know that now from, from watching the stock market, nobody likes unknowns, especially in my business. And we've been dealing with nothing but unknowns. So in our meeting with Moody's coming up, one of the things that we need to stress is our financial stability, which has been excellent. But there's another piece in here that I, I brought to their attention that I wanted to make very clear that we bring up to Moody's and bring up to bondholders when we look for dollars. And that is stability in this room. It was funny, I opened up the front page, I saw Frank Sambit, Sandy Nagler, Don Guevara, John Pashnik, and one other name, and that was it. So thank you for your support. Years. For your support and, and the stability you bring to the school. And the other piece that came up today when we were talking with the administrators is it's budget time again. Even though I have all these unknowns with the current year, doesn't mean we don't stop working for next year. So the information to the budget makers is going out this week. Um, and, and once again, we can't, we can't miss the gorilla in the room. We've got to actually work on two budgets. One that says the COVID is a thing of the past and we go back to how we do things and do things well. And two is a socially distanced approach as we've been involved in now. So hopefully I didn't take up too much time, but if there are any questions. Um, John? I, I have, well, as long as we're talking about finance, it's a general finance question, not specifically what you're talking about. How is our tertiary fund uh, looking? Are we taking many hits? Uh, we, we get the same filings every year. It, it really comes down to when the judge wants to clean their docket. And luckily, they're okay with a dirty docket right now. <laughs> okay. So we haven't gotten any uh, rulings that have gone against us in, in a little bit of time now. Thank you. When will we know what the filing for the refinance or the... Uh, uh, the resolution, I actually have a timeline. The mm -hmm. resolution will be for the board's consideration at January meeting on the 24th. But what, it'll, it actually takes place in 2021, right? That's the eight in, that gets us into the eighth year? Yes. Right, so we have to file April 15th, 2021, we'll make a payment as on the standard schedule. Okay. The new agreement, the first payment would be in October 15th, but the sale itself we expect to happen in January. So okay. we'll know what the rates are, have everything locked in. No. All right, that's good. Because yes, the rates, even though they were fabulous in 2013, boy, don't hold a candle to what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. I know, we'd like to get that done then. That's... This is the right time to do it. And we're in a position to do it. So we're turning over every rock we can and, and scraping every dime that's under there. And if nothing else, just to fend off the, the hits we keep taking. I heard it described last week as a gut punch when this news came out. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a little optimistic, too, and the shop might have been a little low. And we haven't had one peep from Albany yet, right, on anything. Not even a tweet. For our current budget that allegedly uh, is being reduced. Actually, the, the Division of Budget did release their report, and it reads like chunky peanut butter. Mm -hmm. They tell us that there's a $13 billion deficit, and in the same paragraph said the balanced budget is still balanced. Nobody, nobody wants to stand up. And, and yeah, there's a lot of uh, Teflon that's, that's getting chipped away, but it's, it hasn't fallen off yet. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments for Mr. Brennan? Usually brings us such good news. I did. I said we found It is the nature of the beast. <laughs> no, but, you know, we do thank you for staying on top of I mean, everything that is continually evolving. And, you know, when they give with one hand and they take away with the other. Yeah, that's the worst, too. Trying to, you know, keep all the pieces put together. It's greatly appreciated that there's somebody who is so well-versed in the workings of our district. Well, thank you. And I, I wish I could agree with the give with one hand. They didn't give. <laughs> we had to take it. Yeah, there isn't any giving. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Hey, if yes. I may continue. Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, I wanted to provide some additional information. Uh, Mr. Flanagan and Ms. O'Hara reported uh, a little bit on some, uh, a couple of major incidents that occurred in the buildings. So uh, I just wanted to add some additional information. Uh, first of all, I wanted to commend Ms. O'Hara and her health staff over at the elementary school for their handling of the positive case that was reported to us on Friday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the health department is very overwhelmed with investigations at this time, and uh, there was a delay in them conducting their contact tracing, and that contact tracing was not uh, concluded, and we were not informed about that conclusion until this morning. Uh, so as it turned out, on Friday afternoon, we had to make a decision about uh, school for Monday and Tuesday. Uh, We've been very cautious all along, and once again, we took a cautious approach, and we went to fully remote uh, for yesterday and today until that investigation can be, uh, could be com concluded. And as it turned out, it was good that we, we did that because it, it took until today. Uh, so uh, that is the reason for the delay. I did speak with a parent earlier this evening who was upset that uh, the first contact with the infected person was on October 30th, uh, but the parent wasn't notified about that until today. And I explained that the delay was due to uh, the uh, health department's backup and backlog of, of case investigations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's a situation as it is right now with cases increasing. And uh, it's somewhat it's very concerning because we uh, are anticipating that the cases will continue to grow and we are heading towards the holidays and a very potentially dangerous dangerous intersection of increasing cases and holiday travel and large gatherings and we are very uh, concerned about uh, the holidays and, and what may occur after the holidays so once again we want to remind parents to uh, to be aware that the possibility of school closures is increasing on a daily basis and uh, that we are prepared to make a shift to remote instruction, providing meals, free meals to students that request them, and assist parents in locating childcare. Uh, those are all uh, ongoing and very important activities that are taking place on a daily basis. Once again, parents and guardians are reminded, make alternative plans now and have them ready to go for when they are needed. Uh, Mr. Flanagan made reference to a fire alarm that took place here last week, and uh, that occurred on Thursday of last week at around 11.30, and the way that that occurred was there was a burning odor that was noticed in the first floor hallway in the middle school wing. Uh, Mr. Flanagan and our SRO investigated, and uh, they could not determine where the odor was coming from, so, uh, and the odor was increasing, so they deployed, they pulled the fire alarm and uh, the Village of Chester Fire Department responded, uh, as Mr. Flanagan noted, but also uh, we had two units from the Village uh, uh, from Goshen uh, Fire Department and also two units from the Washington Fire Department. So uh, we thank our neighbors for their assistance. Uh, fortunately, the firefighters were able to locate a burned out uh, water fountain compressor and uh, we are ordering a replacement for that. Uh, the cost of, of that replacement is about $600. Uh, and we are checking the compressors and all of the other water fountains in the building at the same time uh, to make sure that they are in, uh, in good shape. Um, tonight on the agenda is listed first readings for the Board of Education of two policies. One of them deals with records management, and uh, the change reflects a recent change that was made, uh, which is a regulatory change. So the language is very similar. Uh, the change to the policy in included a reference to uh, the, pre uh, the new regulatory language. Uh, so that, that policy should look very similar to our board members. And then the second policy is a, uh, a very comprehensive data privacy policy that all school districts are required to adopt this year. Uh, it's a very lengthy policy and is uh, 
actually uh, it incorporates a lot of things that are already in place. Uh, so over the past year, uh, year and a half, in anticipation of, of this uh, new requirement, we have been putting these protections into place. Uh, so this is the final piece, which is to approve the, the policy uh, altogether. Uh, so again, this is a first reading for the members of the Board of Education. And uh, both of these policies will be scheduled for approval at our next board meeting. A uh, couple other things to mention. Uh, our November 24th Board of Education meeting is going to be held remotely uh, to accommodate some scheduling conflicts that, that we're dealing with. Uh, so information about how to access that meeting will be posted on our website on the day or days before that meeting. And uh, on a different topic, I, I wanted to recognize one of our board members uh, who is recognized in this week's edition of On Board. On Board is uh, the publication of the New York State School Board Association. And it provides board members across the state with information about uh, what's happening in, in, in schools and in education. And this particular uh, edition uh, featured a lot of information from this past, month, past month's annual convention. And if you turn to page four, you'll see a beautiful picture of our board vice president, Sandy Nagler. And Sandy was recognized for uh, being one of the top finishers in the game of points. And for her efforts, Ms. Nagler earned $500 for our school district. So thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you. That almost covers the repair of the water fountain. Yeah. <laughs> See, I went to the convention, and I made money for the district. Thanks, Sandy. Nicely done. Um, well, it, this is a, a good time to segue into giving a little brief report on, on that um, convention. Um, thank you to the district for allowing me to attend um, it's always a very important convention to attend because you hear from so many um, top authorities on what is current and emerging in the education world. Um, so I, I do appreciate having that opportunity. Um, the convention this year being all virtual was quite lengthy. It started October 20th and wrapped up on uh, the 31st. So it was a, a much longer than usual convention, but extremely valuable. We heard from all different walks of life, um, the commissioner, the interim commissioner of education, um, Dr. Betty Rosa, the vice chancellor of the New York State Board of Regents, uh, T. Andrew Brown. Um, we covered a lot of uh, business at our business meeting um, on the 31st, over 200 uh, elected delegates from different districts across the state discussed and voted on 26 uh, different proposed resolutions that uh, would set NISBA's, the New York State School Boards Association, agenda for the year on a variety of topics, from special ed to mandating that local IDAs include school districts when planning pilots for businesses, to requesting that New York State expand and enhance capacity for online learning, to opposing raising the number of charter schools, to supporting proposals to restrict and regulate tobacco use by minors, um, to opposing mid-year state aid cuts, um, to enhancing the child abuse reporting training that school personnel receives and, and much more. Um, and those were just on Saturday. Um, throughout the week, there were a great number of educational workshops held as well as um, guest speakers that came in. Uh, we talked about uh, staff diversity, how that affects students. Um, that's a big topic right now, and it's something that every district needs to take a look at and evaluate. Um, since 2014, children of color have been the majority of K through 12 student population, but our ways of reaching those students has not kept pace with reflecting what our student body looks like. 
So that is something that every district should be, be looking at. And using um, not only policy, but people, practices, and performance to retool districts. Um, we talked about mental health. Mental health and school safety are huge, um, including training for staff, student programs, traditional stressors, and now emerging uh, causes of stress. As we know, COVID is deeply impacting families on a number of levels. We discussed um, future work and how schools are preparing students. Um, as innovations like AI, robotics, and drones are displacing skilled workers and transforming industries, worker training and career pathways must transform too. So it's incumbent on us to be looking at what emerging technologies um, we can introduce to our students to make sure they're competitive when they leave our building. Um, as always, there was discussion about um, collective bargaining and how recent COVID concerns are impacting contracts. Uh, we looked at um, a bunch of workshops on state aid, and the information in the state aid workshops were, was not good. <laughs> and that's not because it wasn't a good presentation, but rather because there are still so many unknowns with COVID-19. Um, the impact on state finances and state aid to schools has been extensive and evolving. So there are still many outstanding questions on the 2021 budget, as Mr. Brennan just brought to our attention. But those are in place as we begin to move ahead with crafting our 21-22 budget. We talked a lot about remote learning and what that looks like in terms of workflows, protocols, and new ways of learning, and finding some way to hold on to traditional practices. We touched on short-term and long-term expectations and focus, lesson planning for teachers, building relationships across the screen, mental health and well-being, and new roles. We covered a lot in the area of special education and the obligations schools have to students with disabilities, particularly now. We touched on understanding the needs of LGBTQ students. We looked at school transportation services, both in general and especially now with the impacts of COVID. 60% of school districts statewide have identified a bus driver shortage. So this is not a short-term problem that we're facing, but rather something that's going to impact us and all districts going forward. And as always, there was a big focus on student data privacy and security, especially the new New York State Ed Law 2D and third-party contractors. So while it seemed like a long 11 or 12 days of, um, of seminars, it's because there was a lot of heavy material. And it needed to be spaced appropriately to be able to absorb it, ask questions, and find ways of picking out the pieces that are best to improve your particular district. So I feel it was time and funds well spent to be sitting in all of those sessions. And again, I thank the district for allowing me that opportunity. Yeah, would, you know, every year, like we always say this, the convention is probably one of the more important things we do as far as working with the other school districts across the state. I had a lengthy conversation today with a uh, representative from New York State School Board about um, some of the issues going on right now in the district. Uh, the number one, obviously, was the effects of COVID, our scheduling. Um, and at the end of that long conversation, he wanted to mention, as we already known, that you had uh, won third place in the, uh, in the contest. And I said, the district is very embarrassed that she won third place because as the most competitive person, we probably know that why she didn't win first place in that. Every year at convention, there's a points thing for attending each uh, meeting that you could go to. And she's usually right there at the top of that. So. Uh, very proud of you, almost, but no, great job. They were very um, appreciative, and as a board, we're appreciative because with the way this happened this year with virtual and work, you know, it's funny, in the past, you, 
I could have three days off to go to a convention, but now with doing it virtually and having to, it was, was going to work for most of us on the board. So we all appreciate the time and effort. I know every day as I was talking to you, and you're like, this one's starting in 10 minutes, and I have only five-minute break. <laughs> when we're at these conventions, we're running to get into a room. What was great was that there was never a space that you couldn't get in. So I think that's why you got a lot of information this year. And everything that comes out of the conventions helps our district on top of the $500 award. So we appreciate that also. Thank you. And thank you for attending all that. Anything else for Roundtable? Mr. Passionate, do you have anything for OXPA? Uh, we just had the November OXPA meeting. Uh, what was it, last Wednesday? Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, discussed the uh, convention, the business aspect of it, um, and the proposed resolutions. Uh, there is there's no meeting next month. And uh, so far, that's all I know. Okay. I, I do have a question, though, from Mr. Petrolak regarding the uh, uh, policy and the uh, district-wide safety plan. I, I gather that the district-wide safety plan is internally generated, correct? We don't, we don't get that from Orange, uh, from uh, Erie 1 BOCES, right? Uh, the district-wide safety plan is, follows a template uh, that was developed by Orange Ulster BOCES risk management and is used by many of the districts across uh, the OE BOCES. Okay. I don't know if it's developed on a, on a broader scale, okay. um, but it's, it's also then uh, customized to, to our uh, specific okay, yeah, district. We, but I mean, we massage it as, as per our requirement. Um, the other policy, is that from Erie 1 BOCES? I know before we had uh, uh, well, what was the convention, two years ago, three years ago? Mm -hmm. It was a while ago. Um, we spoke with them, and uh, we were going to get all of our policies reviewed and whatnot. I wasn't sure if that we were still online with getting policy changes from Erie 1. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do contract with Erie 1 BOCES, who specializes in uh, developing policies, policies. They have a team of attorneys that write and review policies, and uh, they send uh, regular updates uh, on uh, changes to the law and regulations and things of that nature. So we are getting those updates. Good. And uh, right, actually, uh, we are in the process of a two-year project working with Erie 1 BOCES to uh, evaluate all of our policies in the district and make sure that they are all up to date and reflect our needs. Uh, this particular policy uh, is 99% of the policy that uh, previously existed. Uh, the, the change is literally just inserting the specific citation to, uh, to the new regulation that's in place. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it may be changed once this uh, policy review, this project, is, is over in two years. Sure. But it meets our needs and the new uh, requirement, which has to be in place by January 1st, and was also reviewed by and recommended by our attorney. Right. Yeah, I remember we were all together. Um, where were we? Syracuse? Syracuse? When, we, uh, when we talked with them, I just wasn't sure if that was still progressing. All right. Thank you. No. <laughs> next week's meeting. Next meeting. Give me, give me a synopsis. <laughs> Anything else for roundtable? No. Anyone else? Roundtable? Okay. That'll bring us to tonight's consent agenda. I'll need a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the board accept consent agenda items 5.1 through 5.7. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That will bring us to our second and final public comment section of tonight's meeting. If there's anyone to make any comments to the board on any item or on the agenda. Buddy. 
And that'll bring us to adjournment. Number eight. I'll need a motion. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Sign. Sign.